Thank you. I, I really do want to thank all the previous uh, presenters. They've uh, made my job a little bit easier to get to the points that I want to get to. I've actually pulled some things out of the presentation so that we can get to some of the more interesting stuff, the, the, the stuff of fantasy, I guess, but perhaps we can get there as well. Uh, so with that, we will move on. Little disclaimer, these are uh, the opinions here are my own. I do not represent any of the systems I'm going to talk about or mention. And uh, so if, if something sounds a little off the wall, blame me. <laughs> so today I'm going to present uh, my topic more like a story. And I broke it down into a few chapters. And I, I, I like to, uh, I'd like to think of uh, this more like, you know, Albert Einstein would do these, you know, these thought experiments. So when I present this stuff, I, I, it's my hope that, you know, everybody kind of thinks about them in, in that manner. Like, you know, just play with it. Don't, don't uh, you know, hold your, your uh, criticism and, and think of it as anything is possible. And uh, we should, should have some fun. So chapter one, there's a, <laughs> I, 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 I want to introduce this concept here because we, we keep hearing artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and they're somewhat interchangeable. I think of artificial intelligence as any system that shows you, you know, it's, it's in performing in an intelligent way. Expert systems, to me, are artificial intelligence systems, but they, they run down the line of a decision tree. Uh, many of them run down the line of a decision tree. We code for that. We program everything into it. But machine learning is a subset of that artificial intelligence, and it's, it's, in this, it's, uh, it's like a new revolution. And I looked online just to get a, you know, somebody's version of the definition of revolution, something I could just put out there. And third definition from dictionary.com is a sudden, complete, or marked change in something. There will be no denying this change. There will be no denying that what artificial intelligence with machine learning will do for us. I mean, this is going to be broad in everything. And as you've heard from all the previous speakers, we can see that it's going to touch everything and, and basically have a incredible value, I, I believe. Then now I separate that from this other concept that you hear people worried about. You know, there's some experts out there or, or people that are uh, uh, who, who we might look toward for, for their opinions, and, the, and they, they have this fear that these systems are going to one day take over. And I think that we're, I want to separate that thought from this synthetic intelligence, which is what I would like to call artificial intelligence for machine learning. And I'll use all those terms interchangeably. We are talking about the machine learning. But that synthetic intelligence, I believe, is different than synthetic consciousness. And synthetic consciousness, I think that's where if, you know, something is pondering or thinking about what should I do or how should I address it. So we'll, we'll separate those two things. I, I'm not really advocating synthetic consciousness. I'm kind of thinking toward synthetic intelligence. Okay. So there, there's, so what's out there? I mean, from the past two days, we, we, we kind of saw a lot of this and I just wanted to mention that some of the stuff that we looked at, whoops, my mouse is not working. Part of the IT issue here. So I don't want to really, I took out some of the slides for what's out there, but I just want to quick mention, you know, we, we see face detection, face recognition, predictive systems. You start typing stuff, you know, it starts appearing and it's like mind reading. Voice response, voice recognition, image classification. I just want to recap on those things because when I talk about the systems that I envision, these are the kinds of things that are working today that we could leverage. And so it's kind of like connecting the dots. So how am I getting to my my wild thoughts. <laughs> so some noteworthy examples, and again, these were hit on, but I'd like to just bring them up again. So you have, uh, you have Watson here, IBM Watson, and yes, as mentioned earlier, Jeopardy winner. But then this is, this was real interesting to me. On 60 Minutes, you got IBM Watson, it's a graduate of med school. And then we have this commercial that pops up that, you know, H&R Block is using it. 
So this stuff is out there and it's being used. And IBM Watson in graduating med school and working in oncology, that's incredible and in the results that they're achieving. So think about, think about that, how fast this stuff is moving from you know, winning on Jeopardy to graduating med school in, in a, sh a few short years and now you know, pretty much on par with a team of experts. This one, as again mentioned from the previous uh, earlier presenter, AlphaGo winning, a complex problem, solved. I don't want to go any further with that, but you know, just a noteworthy mention. This one's one of my favorites, and I mean, Watson's incredible, but this is one of my favorites. So you have Alpha, Alpha AI, and it beats a Top Gun instructor pilot in multiple air-to-air -air combat simulated missions, but, What's really incredible is that they crippled the AI's aircraft and they took away some of its sensors and it still beat that pilot. But the most incredible thing was it was done on a $35 Raspberry Pi. So think about that. So supporting technologies, I'm kind of, when I say supporting technologies, I'm, I'm talking about the technologies that you have to consider, which leads us to anything possible. So th think about how these things might all, all tie together one day. So this is a question that was posed. I received some questions in an email. I responded to them, and that's kind of what got me here. Thank you very much, by the way. I really appreciate it. This is exciting for me. So wh what are the possibilities for human-machine interface that will allow leaders to offload mental and physical responsibilities? And, and, what I want to focus on here is the human-machine interfaces because there, there's something about the history of that. I mean, I'm not going to get into the history of it, but I want to present a few of those things because what, why? You know, why is this important? Because when you think about these man-machine interfaces, these human-machine interfaces, there's an evolution. The punch card, you know, imagine that. So. These are the devices you're all familiar with, but it's the input outputs to the systems that we use. And I can get into vehicle inputs, you know, pedals, controls, knobs, dials, but think about all these things. Every time we create these interfaces, what are we doing? What are we trying to do? We're trying to speed up our ability to use those systems. We're, we're actually moving faster with those systems, getting more out of them in, in a more efficient and, and timely way. That's an additive manufacturing and output device, so it's part of, in my opinion, part of that input output, how we interact with these machines. Touch interface, hey, we went from command line to graphic user interface, big jump, right? Productivity goes up. Now we got touch screen interface, so we're interacting, we're actually getting tactile with the machines in a different way. Haptic feedback, just a show of hands, how many people are familiar with haptic feedbacks? Oh, that's good, very good. For, for those of us that are not very familiar, this is the, the virtual world pushing back on us. And, and it's amazing if you've ever had the uh, experience of actually playing with one of them. If you are in the virtual world reaching in and touching something soft, it feels soft. And if it's rigid and hard, it feels hard. So keep that in mind as we go forward. And so now we're moving into more modern interfaces where we get into virtual reality, augmented reality. And over here, this is a virtual cave, uh, virtual reality cave. This is something where a whole team of people could walk into that virtual space. I've had the uh, pleasure of actually going to a very large virtual reality cave and it, it, you, you really get um, uh, submerged in this environment. And holographic, I mean, this is something that's still out there. You know, it's kind of a mix, what's better? Is it holographic, it is, is it the virtual reality where I have to don goggles on? Is it augmented reality where I don don goggles and I, we all can share this holographic or virtual or this augmented space? So the, all of these technologies are gonna help with that uh, the question of how do, we, how do we perceive the world? How do we perceive this virtual world? How do we perceive that data? So these are kind of more modern. This is moving ahead some of this stuff exists, some of this stuff, is, actually one of these items, this, this virtual, I'm sorry, this contact lens display system is a, to allow you to have that augmented experience without actually wearing all kinds of headgear. And I, I did look that there were a few companies that file for patents to do this, so I don't know where they are in their research, but when this comes about, this will be pretty 
impressive because we talk about equipping the soldier with these wonderful technologies, but we're always burdening them with weight and, and space claim on their platforms. So things like this really improve upon you know, the systems we could provide. And one of the, we're gonna get, we're gonna sew this all up, but one of the reasons that all these man-machine interfaces become important, not just the speed at which we start interacting with these systems, but we, we scale down the systems. Because when we have something like that, and we can reduce the, the size, weight, complexity of that piece of it, and we start looking at something like this, this is a myo gesture controller that uses, uses the electrical impulses of your muscles to control a system, and you have to learn and interact with that. And we'll, we'll actually see an example of that in a little bit. This is an EEG, or skull cap. Uh, there are some games out there where you can actually play a game where you use a little bit of mind control. I tried it, it's, it's, it's kind of on this, it's, if you concentrate, it does one thing, if you don't concentrate, it goes another way. So that's kind of low resolution. This neuro chip, this is interesting in that they're actually implanting this on a person's brain and allowing them to get a higher resolution on the brain activity. So that, you know, if you, if you can start controlling stuff with this and this, imagine when we're getting more data off of the brain and we can understand those patterns. Imagine what we can control in that way. So another question, you know, how, how will artificial intelligence help leaders visualize the combat operations ongoing across the domains? I'm not going to read my response to you, but I want you to think about those visual systems. I mean, if we have multiple domains, where we have a cyber attack, we have uh, munitions that are, you know, or troops that are ready to move here and, and uh, armored si systems that are ready to move there. If we have all these systems, traditionally you might see them as pegs on a map. I can't see cyber. I can't see that. But if I could be utilizing one of those visualization systems, holographic, augmented reality, virtual reality, virtual reality cave, and decision makers can step into that space, and we're looking at our battle space, and all of a sudden we see a, a, a massive color change, or we have artificial intelligence or synthetic intelligence monitoring all of the data that's coming in and pointing us to an area of interest and changing that map for us, creating that heat map, that that means something now. I, I didn't see a physical explosion, but I'm seeing a precursor to an event visually. I could respond to that a lot faster. So, and that, that was the visualization piece. And basically, once again, I give you this example of a hologram, but when this technology gets better, instead of stepping into a virtual cave, you might step in around a holographic space. A uh, good example was uh, Avatar, the movie Avatar. They had a nice holographic command center. Virtual reality, again, if, uh, if you haven't tried this stuff, I urge you to go out and try it. It's great. I bought myself a couple of units and shared it with my friends. It's a, it's a nice experience. It's only getting better. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a tool that we can utilize for, for the things that we're speaking of. Again, skipping over the cave at this point. Augmented reality. So I've had some experience with augmented reality, reality at this point. And what is amazing about this is when the tracking is done right, that overlay, that ability to see an object overlaid in the real world and move around that object, the perception of it being a real world object is nearly perfect with the exception of the, the restricted view at, with current technology. But as it gets better, especially if we get to the point to wearing a contact lens, the, the amount of the, I'm sorry, take that back. The ability for us to learn is going to accelerate. I went to a conference where they actually refer to, and I love the term, high bandwidth learning. You think about back in the day, if one person has to train another person, it's slow. If I write a book about a topic and I hand and print multiple copies and give it to a thousand people, in the same amount of time, I could educate a thousand people. I take a computer and I do the same thing. Now I'm reaching out to more people through this networking. I go to multimedia and now I use multiple modalities to educate people. They learn faster. You have a technology like this. Now I'm immersing you in an environment that you can learn faster. But all of this is going to be supported technologies for 
artificial intelligence in, in, uh, for some of the examples I'm going to give you. The Meyer Just Controller, I'm going to show you an example on that. I'm going to skip these actually because we did cover them. So the Meyer Just Controller, this is an example I'd like you to take a look at. This gentleman, Johnny Matheny, if anybody uh, knows anything about the DARPA research, I met this gentleman at DARPA Day last year. And if you look at how he's controlling that, you might think, oh, he's got to think, let me move the arm this way, let me press down this way, let me do this or that. And I asked him, I said, well, how, how are you controlling this? And he said, well, I said, well, if you had a point, what would you have to do? He goes, well, I just point. And he pointed. And then I asked something else, is, well, what's the lag time? What's the, what's the response time on this? And he said, oh, about 150 milliseconds. I'm like, oh, it adds 150 milliseconds? No, 150 milliseconds. Wait a minute. As a biologist, I know that the that loop time is about 300 milliseconds. So you're telling me you can respond in half the time as a person with a natural arm? He goes, yes. I go, you should go on Jeopardy. Hit that buzz faster than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's neat stuff. And I mean, think about it. When you drive your vehicle, and I've used this example with a few of you to, uh, that we talked offline. When you get in your car, when, you're, when you first got your driver's license and you stepped in your vehicle, and I remember the first time I was observing and peeking and trying to you know, make sure that I wasn't going to hit anything because I, I, didn't, I didn't know what the boundary of the vehicle was. But when I get in my car today, I could whiz through traffic and clear vehicles with inches on either side. I, I could park my vehicle and get within an inch of someone's bumper because my mindset, I've extended the boundary of self when I use that machine. That human machine interface changed the perception of that vehicle to an extension of myself. And it's an important concept for, for some of the things I'm gonna mention. So this, this is one of, one of my favorites. In 2013, a blind boy is able to see through his tongue. So he, he basically, there's a webcam. There's a webcam here. They're processing the image data here. And then basically, they feed that down to a tongue patch. And on that tongue patch, they stimulate the tongue. So the images become stimulant to the tongue. Now that might seem like, wow, why did they use the tongue? Well, the, there's a, a considerable amount of uh, brain real estate dedicated to the tongue, as for tactile. If you consider it touching something versus what your tongue has dedicated to it, your tongue has considerable more brain real estate. That's why children are not tasting everything. Little babies aren't tasting everything. They're looking at it. Their eyes and their, their visual centers aren't built up yet. They're, they want to know what the world looks like. And once they studied it tactile with their tongue, then they start, hey, with the machine learning or the synthetic intelligence, to learn something, you, you know, they have to label data. There, there's unlabeled learning, but the, the, the most successful stuff so far has been with labeled data. So as a child, sticking it in their mouth, they have this unlabeled data out here, but now they're labeling it, basically. I know what it is. I know the shape of it. So the, the ability for our brains to pull meaning out of data, this is a perfect example of how flexible our brains are. So in the mid-90s, I brought the same concept to my professor, but not for vision, but for hearing. I happened to be deaf in my left ear, and so what happened was I went to my professor with this idea because I had this uh, TENS unit where we would stimulate the muscles to, for healing and I, it had these varied amplitudes and varied frequencies and I said well you know that reminds me of sound I got varied frequencies and varied amplitudes if I took a microphone used a band splitter and split up the bands applied that to something like a TENS unit across multiple patches I bet you I can make a deaf person hear and, I, it, and he said nah you can't do that it won't work well, being an undergrad and looking up to my professor, and he's probably watching right now because we had the conversation last week, and he goes, ah, I, I, you shouldn't have listened to me. <laughs> I said, well, you were, the, you were the expert, so I had to listen. But uh, yeah, I believed it could work then. And the reason, I, I was 20 years ahead, right? 20, no, yeah, almost 20 years ahead. I was 20 years ahead on the idea, and the reason I believed is because I believed, hey, if you could read Braille, 
by touching, or you could figure out what somebody looks like by touching, your brain is rewiring, rewiring to that data. It understands this data. I mean, we might not be able to do it. And, and because I'm deaf in one ear, I've also noticed that I'm not a lip reader where I could watch, you know, have a conversation with you just looking at you and reading your lips. But I noticed one day I, I couldn't hear somebody until I was looking at them. I could hear the words, but I couldn't understand the words. So when I looked at them, the words were clear. And one day, I ran into the store, and my dad was being a little impatient, and, he's, and I see him outside the glass, and he goes, all right, come on, will you hurry up? And I, I heard him say, and that's when I realized that my brain was filling in the sounds to match his lips. That's when I realized that that's why I have to look at people when I'm speaking to them, or else I'm not sure what they're saying. The words become a little bit of a blur. And that, that made me realize how plastic our brain was, how, uh, how flexible we were, taking all this abstract data and turning it into meaning. So let's fast forward. Now we're getting, you, you got that background technology, and I may have missed a few things because it's like anything else. When, you, when you're, in, you're doing it all the time, you feel like you, know, you, you have information that other people don't have. I'm hoping that from yesterday to today that, that, uh, that we have enough information to buy into what I'm saying. So I say from, some, from today's view, we'll imagine that anything is, a, anything is possible until it's not. And, I, and what I mean by that is it's only not possible when we've exhausted everything and still not found a way. So let's just assume anything is possible. That said, I'm going to present a vision I have here. The ultimate match. Bridging the gap between man and intelligent sheets. And by the way, Susan B. Anthony fought in court and said that man is a neuter term. So when I'm saying that, I'm not excluding women here. That's, that's a neuter term, man and mankind. <laughs> so given the promise of these technologies where the blind can see and, and the brain chip is allowing people with disabilities to control devices, imagine a, a quadriplegic getting that brain chip and being able to control that wheelchair or communicate or type just because there's a higher resolution of the, the brain's data getting out to a machine that's interpreting that. So let's consider the following. You have this EEG collecting data at a lower resolution. You introduce the brain chip, so now you're collecting at a higher resolution. They're already controlling stuff with the EEG. Now you're getting higher resolution, you don't have to wear that spaghetti on your head. And there's a, your example of uh, a paraplegic or quadriplegic, basically a disabled person using this system to control. So the development of this system to control things, well, there's some pattern that the brain is giving off that they're interpreting to carry, a, carry out some control. My, my idea here is that let's collect all of the data from a person like this. If there's people out there that have to get this technology planted anyway, or, or part of, uh, you know, say the experiments to have this technology plan, let's ask if they would participate in an experiment, in a non-invasive experiment. Experiment is I'd like you to just sit in a dark room for a few minutes. I want to have a video camera hooked up. I want to have a microphone hooked up. And I'm going to present objects, and I'm going to turn the light on for a few seconds, have you think about what you see, turn it off. And I'm going to collect all that raw data from your brain, and now I'm going to collect the labeling data, the actual image, the actual sounds, and I'm going to keep that data. And if we do it across multiple people and we start to create a large enough data set, could we not use machine learning to sift through those patterns to find out what does this brain pattern mean when I expose you to this stimulus? So can we start mapping the brain in a different way? So if we can conceive of, hey, we could start understanding what those flashes and patterns in the brain are. And I'm not saying off a single one of those little chips, because I don't believe that's a high enough resolution. I'm thinking maybe if there's more sensitivity, you know, more systems incorporated, to get a better resolution on what's going on in the brain. If we're getting more and more data and we're getting better understandings of what these patterns represent, what happens if I play it backwards? What happens if I now understand the pattern and I know that if, you know, maybe you had that happy feeling 
I showed you a picture of when you were a young child and it was a birthday party and you smiled and that was a happy feeling. We picked up on that pattern. And now I know what that pattern was and I kind of force it back. I stimulate the brain in certain areas to recreate that pattern. Will you have that happy feeling? It's just a show of hands. How many people believe you would have that happy feeling? So it's about mixed. So there was research that was done with a rat or a mouse. And I thought it was incredible. They, they basically had a genetically modified mouse that whenever it created proteins, if they gave it a, a chemical or a, yeah, gave it a chemical before it created a protein, it would incorporate an optical sensitive compound. And so what they did was they took this rat or mouse, they gave it the compound so that if it formed a protein, it will incorporate this optically sensitive compound. They put it in a cage that had all the best conditions for this mouse. And it was perfect lighting, perfect bedding, it had a place to hide, it had food, and that the mouse was physically happy. It was whiskers were going, it was cleaning itself, and you could see it was hopping around, it was happy. So that at that point, it just discovered this new environment, it just discovered this happy place, so its brain had to make the wiring, had to create, create those synaptic junctions that represented what it was learning. And then what the research did was it took the rat, out, the mouse out of the cage, put it into a cage where it was bright light, no bedding, just hard surfaces, no place to hide, no food, and the mouse froze. The mouse seized up and froze because it was frightened. Deer in the headlights, froze. So then what they did was one more thing they did to this mouse. They had a little port on its head. And this port allowed them to put a high intense light so that it would illuminate the whole brain. You've done that where you put a flashlight on your finger and you could see how red the light passes through you know, that much tissue. I mean, the mouse's brain is smaller than the tip of my thumb, so that's not too hard to believe that I can permeate light through all that tissue. When she turned the switch on, the, the deer in the headlight went away. The mouse was happy. Whiskers twitching, smiling, everything went good. As soon as she turned the switch off, the mouse was deer in the headlights again. On, off, on, off. Turned on the happy, sad, happy, sad, because she was hitting those neurons that were the same neurons, uh, I'm sorry, those neuron, neur blah, synaptic gaps that were formed. She was hitting those again and waking them up. So you could. You could turn on a memory. You could turn on that emotion or feeling. So that's where we're going with the pattern here. So now I'm thinking, well, if you could take it out and you can play it back, well, could we use synthetic intelligence or machine learning and run it backwards? And yeah, you could. <laughs> so you might have seen this on the internet. Uh, these are pictures where they've shown a picture, an image, to a synthetic intelligence. It goes through the system, and it comes up with a label. Then runs the label back. What would it be if given that label? And they just kept feedback loop until it started dreaming these images. There's another one. And this one is, uh, it first was shown clouds, and what do you see? And it started forming pictures on top of the clouds that it was looking at. So the system can play backwards. So if I have a synthetic intelligence, a little Raspberry Pi, that understands these patterns of mood or patterns of imagery or sounds or smell or touch, and I go in one direction, I get to say, oh, you're looking at an apple, or, oh, or you feel happy. Maybe I, maybe I don't have the resolution that you're looking at an apple, but maybe, or you feel happy about this current state. I know what happy is. Now you're sad, so I run it backwards. I say, put happy, and you're going, wow, now you're happy. And I'm not saying you should build a machine just to make people happy and sad by a flip of a switch. What I'm saying is, as we increase that resolution of the patterns of the brain, we get a better understanding of it. And we utilize machine learning to look at the enormous amount of data we might collect, then we can have a better understanding of all that brain activity. Then we can have an ability to push that data back onto the brain. And if we have that, so then the question becomes, 
it, oh, by the way, this is the link. If you guys want to play with that, you can uh, sit, put your own pictures up there. And got to go. It takes a couple of days for it to dream about your picture. You'll get some neat stuff back. But we can do that. We can get this ultimate upgrade, right? We can go back and forth. So instead of using it for a prosthetic, we're built. I'm sorry. Instead of using it for controlling prosthetics, we can build a brain prosthetic. Basically, give people like a sixth sense. At first, we can get these positive and negative feelings, maybe, at a lower resolution. But as we get more and more data, we can go in a, in a place where we, we're getting, maybe we could give you the sense of, uh, of something, give you an intuition. So that now I'll just paint a picture. I'm, I'm a soldier, and I'm, or anybody for that matter. And I, I, have a, uh, I have some sensors picking up environmental data. My little system is monitoring all that sensory data. And I'm moving along benign to any, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on. I, I'm okay with it. The, the scenery looks fine to me because I don't have expertise. You know, if I'm running with an expert, something's up, they sense it. But I don't have that expertise. So I'm walking along, everything seems fine, but not, everything's not fine. Something is going on in my environment that my synthetic intelligence picks up on. Instead of putting out a thing in front of me with stuff to read or sound that I can't hear because maybe, you know, there's a truck engine right next to me and I, and I don't hear a tank running and I don't hear that. Instead of that, I just get a feeling something's wrong or don't move or retreat or something, just some warning that's like intuition, like some feeling like you would experience not knowing why, gut feeling, but it's, it's on track because the way you would have experienced, the way you would have felt that if you had the experience, if you've been in this situation that was wrong and knew that something was wrong, you're now getting it from a system. And if that system was connected to other soldiers or other people and they experience something and they share it and we somehow can move that experience around, imagine if two units in two different parts of a, a, a country one unit walks in, something bad happens, they deal with it, but their system just learned about the environmental variables. And another unit is about to fa face this another method of operation by, by the enemy because they decided this was a good tactic to use against us. And this other unit starts walking into the same trap, but before they even get into the trap, they get an eerie feeling that something's wrong because they just got distributed some data that says, stop, something's wrong. We don't have to, you know, and then you can assess and maybe get the, that's enough time to get the report, something bad's happened. So I, I'm, I'm considering the fact that if we can continue to expand upon how these intel, you know, how we can read what's going on in your mind, play it back into your mind. Well, if I can play back an experience, my own experience back to myself, can I play back that experience to somebody else? Could I go learn something and instead of you having to learn it, I just share that learned experience with you. Could this take learning? To, you want to talk about high bandwidth learning using augmented reality. Where does this put us as far as learning? But also, I, I think in a way, I, you know, all the people screaming that the machines, oh, they're going to they're gonna get smarter than us, they're going to make us obsolete. What if the machines make us smarter? And what if collectively there's no way that one machine with great intelligence, greater than any individual intelligence, could actually be, be smarter than us collectively. And we know this is, we know this is possible, right? If you've seen the, the TV show, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Let's ask the audience. You know, the average intelligence of all the people in the audience collectively is better than the smartest person standing on that stage. So if the collective intelligence of people who now have this amplified knowledge or this amplified skill collectively will be smarter than any intelligent machine. And I mean, it's just, this is science fiction right now, but I believe it would be possible one day. And I believe the supporting technologies will get us there. Uh, one technology, say, uh, the bi bioactive compounds coming out of material sciences, what if I can make a very thin filament that I insert into your brain instead of putting chips on it? I could actually encourage uh, neuron, uh, neural development to come out, take advantage of those stem cells in the brain and grow grow a connection to the surface so they can get data from the center of the brain. 
maybe a little bit beyond this conversation. So what platforms for machine learning? We're going to do a little rewind now. What platforms? So you've got the traditional platforms. We spent the past day and a half looking at the uh, various platforms. So just a picture. Obviously, if we take these uh, robotic platforms and make them intelligent, then we can actually get the directives. Instead of, instead of having them remote control to a site where there's a human operator pushing them somewhere, instead of giving it waypoints, we could just say, hey, look, here's a target. There's targets in this region. Go, go find it. Let me know when you find it. And, or go take care of it. It's done. But I like these better. <laughs> so the life like platforms. And I would just take a look at, at these and, and consider why these would be better. I mean, it's, it seems very obvious. So this is why the machines are going to go after us. <laughs> so yeah, again, yeah. If you really want to have fun, go watch the YouTube video. Somebody uh, did a sound overlay on it. They gave it the sound of a dog getting kicked or something. <laughs> but uh, so why why is this better? And Boston Dynamics, that's great stuff. So here's something to consider. What if these things were low cost, numerous, long running times, durable, intelligent, and armed? What other trends will greatly impact, accelerate, amplify, or amplify with the explosion of artificial intelligence and autonomy in society and war? Again, I don't want to read my response. I, I just am uh, presenting the question I received so you can think about it the way I was thinking about it. We may share an understanding or we may have a different view of it. The disruption. This is what I thought of when I read that question. So these technologies are going to disrupt our society. Maybe aware that there's, uh, there's robotic surgery. Uh, I believe this one's Da Vinci. So the surgeon can get in and do some microsurgery, get into a very small world and do the surgery. Well, imagine if a synthetic intelligent system was performing the surgery, say, like Watson. Now, I don't think this is so far of a stretch because if I have a system that can understand and read diagnostic stuff better than a human can, and they've already shown that that's the case, it's these things that people don't see. If it's got that, and we have robotic systems that can place with great precision parts on things and do wells, so couldn't the robot, if it's given the visual information that the doctor's seeing, and it knows the pathology, knows what it has to do, couldn't it as well move those instruments exactly where they need to be, excise something, sit something up. I, I, I think it's totally within the realm of, you know, a few years to within a decade. So, another disruption. They're making parts. Right now, I give it the file and I say, produce this. But it doesn't have to be me. It could be the synthetic intelligence system doing that. Right now, teach pendants or scripts, do this over and over and over. But if I put something else there, it's gonna keep doing that. So it's not gonna give me the, the result. But if I have a synthetic intelligence and in a distributed way, we're sharing the same file about what needs to be produced. I went from producing the part to assembling the part to, oh, by the way, we can do finishing the part. And what you're looking at here is they basically painted on top of a liquid, the dimensional image in a two space so that when they press down, it would conform to it and finish the part on one side. And I only use this example because it could be any kind of parts finishing to you have a final product. So now I went from create the part, assemble the parts to a, an assembly, and then finish the assembly to a finished product. We already looked at the automated platforms. Can't wait till my car. Ford is saying what? Four years? 2021? There are no steering wheels in the car, no pedals. They don't want people driving. So 
So automated farming, planting the food, tending to the food, looking for the invasive other plants, weeds, getting them out without using pesticides or herbicides, getting rid of the, those agents that would harm the plant, maybe get us higher yields off the same crops without putting on the, it costing us more to put those chemicals on there. Automated harvesting. So just for a second, think about this. Don't think of it just in farming. I just went from planting it to tending to it, caring to it, processing it, to harvesting it. I showed you the automated platform. It could be delivered, driving people around, moving products around, moving subsections of the manufacturing process to places they need to be, all automated, all under a synthetic intelligence system, moving everything around. So we don't need people to do that. Maintenance support. This is a little, you might not agree with me on the stretch here. So this robot was allowed to watch YouTube videos on cooking, and then it started cooking. So I want one. <laughs> and again, with the, this very creative robot, right now it's just putting the dishes in the dishwasher, but what if it was fixing the dishwasher? Okay. Sure, could be fixing the dishwasher. And we've seen the robotic vacuums. So I just wanna skip that for a second. Just real quick, if those things are creating our products, harvesting our food, say harvesting and processing our energy needs, what's the cost of everything? Cost should go way, way down. So now we can build those weapon systems that'll be, they'll be really cheap, relatively cheap. And um, for immediate use, I, I'm going to skip this for now. I mean, the, a lot of people spoke of that. Uh, so this, I come up with this idea of a battle buddy, and this would give you a, a, the soldier situation awareness. So kind of like what I said before with that connected to the brain, but not connected to the brain. Now we use haptic controls to tap you and let you know something's happened, what you see, take the sensory response, and basically increase your ability. See outside human vision, hear beyond human range sense the world in a way you never sensed it before and wear it like a suit. Fully autonomous platforms, that goes back to the question before. When you looked at those lifelike systems that can go anywhere, imagine them fully autonomous and armed. And then I had this one idea and I gotta kind of make it go fast. Uh, what if we weren't just translating human language? What if we were translating the language of animals? I mean, the military has been using animals before, and they still do. And I'm not advocating do, you know, anything that's going to cause protest. Oh, this guy wants to use animals. I'm just saying that could we utilize the information by understanding the patterns of the animals? Could we, can we take that enormous data set, like when these people monitor whales forever? Can we learn something? Maybe the whales can tell us where all the submarines are. I don't know. <laughs> so it's, you know, maybe they're telling each other where the submarines are, and we, if we understand that. You know, if we understand that language, because it's, a, it's just data, and we give that data set, and we let it fill the trail and find out what's meaningful in that data. And so the issues. So the issues. So this was, I'm actually going to read my response on this one. This is, what are the ethical considerations and vulnerabilities of using or not using autonomous systems in lethal operations? And I say on an ethical note, this technology is still emerging, and there may be side effects that are unforeseen. Given that creating lethal systems would free us from putting our forces in harm's way, we must consider the risk of these systems causing harm where we have not intended. Additionally, understanding that we could remove the consideration of loss of life for our soldiers, there is a risk of choosing to deploy these systems with less regard for the consequences and potentially extend conflicts. extended conflicts could be a result. Again, if it doesn't cost much, and it doesn't, we're not sh shedding blood, you know, how much thought are we putting in? Uh, also, by creating a buffer between our direct awareness of conflict and the consequences of conflict, it may have a dehumanizing effect on our decision-making process. Another ethical consideration is, if we have this technology, we do not use it, but instead continue to put people in harm's way, 
Are we knowingly making a choice to let our soldiers die when their life need not be lost? If we have these systems and it is generally understood that we are not going to use the technology, does this invite our adversaries to test us and draw us into conflicts they otherwise would not have sought to? On vulnerabilities, we must consider having these systems captured, reverse engineered, turned against us, hacked, etc. In the case of them, in case of them, in, well, I skipped that one. In, uh, I'm sorry. Give me one. Additionally, vulnerabilities may be in the form of utilizing knowledge of how the systems are uh, classify the patterns from the data and generating an overwhelming amount of outlying data to promote low confidence scores and to a high probability, in essence, blinding the systems from both the truth and the data that, and, and the data having the systems generate poor options with predictable outcomes that could lure our forces into trap. We also have to consider the fact that what if we deploy the systems in, in, a, in a legitimate way? We need them out there, and somebody does, say, redirect part of those forces that are wearing our flag to another group of people and provokes a conflict with somebody we're not in conflict with, and they're flying our flag. So now, you know, there, we, we're just, just, it's just putting it out there for us to think about. You know, it's, it's, a, we, it's exciting. We want to do these things, we want to have these great stuff, but we, we really have to put the thought in. But it is an exciting time, and I'm really, uh, I, I really look forward to w what happens. And I, I do believe that that connection between us and the machine is very doable technology. So with that, I'm going I'm to end, and I'm open to questions. Wow, I answered everybody's questions. <laughs> oh, we got one. What are your ethical, uh, what are the ethical questions that you would raise in terms of uh, how much of a man-machine interface? How much of a man-machine interface? Like, where should we draw the line? Or yeah, I mean, how much augmentation goes beyond a certain point? And uh, so, what's the, what are the ethics in terms of that and deciding that? So I, I, I've been thinking about this too. I mean, as exciting as it sounds to basically have this way to become super intelligent and super aware, well, then I'm part of a hive. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm becoming part of a hive because now if, if I can get these remote experiences in, what if somebody hacks that? And now they're controlling my will by way of my mood, by my, my reward systems. It's an exciting idea to do it if you can control it, but there, the ethical question is, how do you prevent taking somebody's will away from them if you have an external system that is actually tapped into their own brain? So, yeah, that is an ethical concern. It's a big concern, and I don't know how many people would sign up to do this. But from, you know, as a scientist, I, I'm curious. I want to know, can we do it? I believe we could. Should we do it? That's another question. That's, a, that's, for, that's what the debate is for. You know, sounds like a great idea, but is it worth what we give up to do it? Oh, and by the way, just because all this stuff may sound great or scary, depending on which side of the camp you're on, imagine if we don't do it and an enemy does, and it doesn't cost them anything to deploy enormous volumes of systems onto our continent, and basically, we'll, you know, we're, they have an infinite supply of machines because they're building them at will. They're not even building them, the machines are building them. The power is free. They're coming in and harvesting our own resources against us. So I think that makes us feel like maybe we have to consider that and consider how fast we need to get there before somebody else does. One, one more question. Sure. So um, very interesting um, outlining, you know, uh, where a lot of these potential, uh, where a lot of these potential areas are. Kind of one question that I have is with these technologies and, and, and these potentials in the future, what combinations do you see that are, will give us that exponential capability where just the parts themselves, um, you know, the, 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 basically the, the combination is greater than the sum of the parts. 
they're kind of, you know, where do you see the convergence of some of these you know, te technical areas where we'll get some exponential um, opportunities for the, the U.S. Army? So, okay, I, I had some slides that address that somewhat, and I threw them out because a lot of people have spoke about that. I, there, there are some technologies that are really going to help here, but one of the crucial ones I see is power. I mean, a lot of this stuff is great in the lab. And a lot of the stuff people have solved, they, they pick a problem, they solve it. They, they, look, look, we've got a terrain issue, we can get across the terrain. We've got this issue, we can do that. We have an understanding issue, we'll go back and tweak the software, we'll tweak the learning model. But it's all short-lived. There's no mission if it only works for two hours. I mean, maybe in some limited way. But I imagine these things have to be out there for you know, days at a time, and they'll have to charge up in fractions of the time. So whatever the power source is has to get the energy in f much faster than it depletes. And one of the promising technologies I was looking at was graphene. I mean, it gives you strength, it gives you high conductivity, it gives you energy densities that they're showing in the lab that's orders of magnitudes more than lithium ion cells are giving us. So those technologies need to catch up and they're, they're here. I mean, they're, they're advancing them now. So what I'm suggesting 30 years from now, I'm making the assumption that we've solved the uh, battery issue. With, uh, with material sciences and the, the uh, bioactive compounds. The ability to say, in a very low intrusive way, kind of pipe in and get data out without damaging cells by promoting some growth to get some you know, conduct connectivity to the core of your brain. I mean, that to me seems like a possibly improvement. You guys heard of CRISPR the past few days. I was going to talk about CRISPR. I felt it was covered pretty good for the, the area. But CRISPR is really a serious technology. If anybody has not or is not aware of CRISPR technology, please watch the TED Talks, watch some of the YouTube videos on see whatever you can look on this. I, I, my first degree is pre-med. My second one was computer science. And, and during pre-med, I absolutely loved genetics. I loved microbiology, chemistry. I, I really got into all of it. And back then, restriction enzymes, you would, you would just hack up DNA in multiple places. You couldn't go in and just take one gene out. You couldn't go in and take one gene out and insert another gene. That was not the case. CRISPR changes all that. I mean, talk, they, they took mice that had white hair as adults and turned them into black-haired mice by changing the gene, the macroorganism. That's incredible. We, we might take the data from machine learning and be able to modify ourselves into a super warrior. There's a lot of tech out there, and it's the machine learning that's going to help us get through that data. We're good? Thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity.